Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you will be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future, as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daniela from Generation to Generation and Operation Open Eyes, and our guest today is Helen Taylor. Uh, Helen, for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from, maybe originally, uh, and where you are now, and tell us a bit about what you do? Yeah, sure. Well, great to be on the podcast with you guys. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I am originally from northeast London, and uh, eight years ago, moved to the States, moved to America to work for the anti-trafficking organization Exodus Cry. Uh, that I still work for and I'm currently serving as the director of intervention and we were based in Kansas City, Missouri, right in the middle of America and then a year ago relocated the whole organization to California um, but all well, my family is still in England. Um, I got my green card last year um, which was an um, amazing answer to prayer and blessing but I still feel very very much still connected to the, the UK and come over um, and love what the Lord is doing over in England as well as here in the States. And for people that listen to this and they say, I want to find out more about what you're doing, I want to see more about Exodus Cry, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Can you just say a bit about um, where they can find you, any of your content, resources, all that stuff? Yeah, um, well, our website is exoduscry.com and we have a YouTube channel where our films and documentaries can be watched. Um, our first film, Nefarious, is available for free on YouTube. We put it on there uh, earlier this year and it's obviously I'm biased because I work for Extra Scribe, but I think it's um, the best documentary showcasing globally what is happening in the sex trafficking industry and pointing to the redemption and the solutions as well. And then we have one film on Netflix um, our Instagram and all our handles, et cetera, is at Exodus Cry. And um, a major part of our whole ministry and organization is messaging, media, shifting culture, providing resources and education. And even you, Daniela, were just sharing with me how you've screened Nefarious and it's been used as an amazing tool to educate. And we hear stories and testimonies around the world from people who are fighting trafficking full time from as a result of seeing that film and hearing the invitation of God to give their life to this. So, um, yeah, we have a podcast as well. I mean, there's loads of, of resources. Um, and I'll probably mention it again at the end of the podcast, but um, at Exodus Cry, find us on Instagram and Facebook or whatever social channels and then YouTube as well. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put the links to all of those in the description. So if people listening, go straight to the description box and uh, go check out their resources and, and the website and social media. Absolutely. And yeah, like you're saying, that film Nefarious, go watch it. Everybody, if you haven't seen it, head uh -huh. over to YouTube and go watch it. it. What I love about it is it gives such a great overview of what trafficking is, what it looks like in various countries. And like you said, it ends with hope. And I think that just that in itself is what sets it apart from all the others I know mm. so many people have said they've watched whatever film on trafficking and it's just left them feeling hopeless and like the problem is so big and what can they do but what I love about Nefarious is it ends with hope and you leave going all right Jesus we got this let's go <laughs> so yeah, I love it totally. I was living in Cambodia when I watched it actually um and some of the girls in the film were girls that I'd worked with um, that, I mean, it's a very crazy cool story of how I ended up working for Exodus Cry. Um, but I watched the film in, in Cambodia and I'd seen by that time many documentaries on this issue that frequently left me feeling so much just anger or rage or almost despair with how, I mean, the suffering of, of sex trafficking is like off the charts of, of the human scale of suffering. Yeah. And um, without that hope, as you said, Daniela, it's it's almost the darkness is overwhelming. You don't want to know anymore. You want to shut your heart off in self-preservation and be like, I don't want to hear anything more about this. And I love that Nefarious doesn't hold back from talking about the, the harder things and the realities of sex trafficking, but, mm. um, but invites you into being the solution or hearing from the survivors themselves and um, 
yeah, it, it's hugely inspiring. I must have watched it more than a hundred times, having screened it um, many places around the world too, as well as you. Um, and it, it it has, I feel like it's an anointed film. Like there's something really special on it, and it 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 gives that, um, yeah, the hope of redemption that's possible, um, and even begins to break down some of the legislation and it's been shown in the White House and before the UN and before different parliaments and it's been used to shape laws which is really exciting as well yeah wow. totally agree and we, and we want to talk a bit about this um, trafficking hub campaign uh, and it's been all in the news over the last couple of weeks before we do that um, can you tell us more about Exodus Cry some of the wider work they do you know they've got the documentaries um, but what, what's some of the other things that Exodus Cry are involved with yeah, um, so we've sort of modelled our organisation after William Wilberforce, who obviously I'm sure we're all fans of, and <laughs> just the, um, the the blueprint of abolition that he laid out before us of um, what it takes to um, not just dismantle a system of slavery, but really um, shift the mindset and culture behind it that allows it to thrive. And... Um, looking at his life and example and how it took several decades for him to shift an entire perspective of Western civilization regarding slavery mm. and how there was the use of the arts involved with that and the the, the community aspect of the Clapham set, the, um, the connection with the arts and, and him physically taking people even on that journey, taking them to the slave ships, showing them the maps of um, those you know, the, the real um, actual ships and conditions of, of the slaves and um, Thomas Clarkson's essay that went viral and just kind of looking at the strategy that they used and thinking in our modern day technology that does have the potential to be used for so much harm that what we're seeing in other ways, but how can we utilize that to really um, shift cultural perspectives on sexual exploitation? And so I'd say out, we have like three pillars at Extra Cry and the first one is um, shifting culture. So telling the stories of survivors, um, shifting the narrative, helping people understand the realities of the sex industry um, uh, through films, documentaries, even short animated videos that could go viral and um, conversations, podcasts, blogs. Um, and then our other pillar is um, changing laws and the two of those kind of are almost classified under abolition and changing laws to better improve anti-trafficking laws around the world um, and then outreach directly reaching victims um, in exploitation so that's that's my department and I take teams both around the states and um, internationally when we do big mobilization initiatives around the major world sporting events like the Olympics and the World mm. Cup and then it, in the past, we've done the Super Bowl here in the States. And we go to everywhere where the sex industry exists. So prostitution um, on, on the streets. We go to strip clubs and um, Asian massage parlors where there's exploitation taking place there. Reaching women uh, advertise for sex over the internet, texting them, meeting up with them. Um, going to brothels in states and countries where there are brothels and red light districts and then training people in how to start and sustain outreach and really wanting to help the church engage with this issue and not be fearful of it or feel like um, it's it's too dark dark of a world for them to engage in but really mm -hmm. helping them understand that like Matthew 16 reality of Caesarea Philippi being a modern day red light district at the time where mm. Jesus took his disciples and declared on this rock, I will build my church and the gate of Hades will not prevail. And that's a whole other talk for another time, but just <laughs> really feeling so um, passionate about the, the church's responsibility to engage in justice and, um, and justice not being something that's separate from the gospel, but an integral inherent part of it. Mm. And the Isaiah 61 chapter that Jesus quotes as his mission in Luke 4 and just really um, that being our passion and goal and having it like a 20 year vision at Exodus Cry, um, not just living in the moment of how do we help those being exploited in the here and now, but how do we prevent sex trafficking, pull it up, pull exploitation up from the roots um, and really go after demand and the factors that are driving um, sex trafficking, which is largely uh, male demand, which is largely marketed by pornography, 
um, which partly links and ties back into our trafficking hub campaign. But we just feel very, um, yeah, very passionate about having a long term picture and wanting to, um, if you, yeah, picture a tree, not just uh, assist the individual fruits or, or apples, or even have a, a trafficker arrested that you know removes twenty apples or twenty girls from that. Where a tree and a system that allows exploitation continues to grow and thrive. But what is the trunk? What are the systems? What are the roots? Um, so that's kind of um, a bit of an overview of what we do, what our goals are. Um, at Extra Sky. I love it. So. So how did the um, Trafficking Hub campaign start? What, what was the origin of that? Yeah, well, my colleague has spent several years researching exploitation in pornography and looking at the, the harms, the addictive nature of it, especially when children are exposed to pornography. Um, and then so not just the harms for the consumer on their brain and, um, and body, but um, how it can affect and impact relationships and society and just researching the porn industry as well and then my my boss Benji he began um, filming a documentary around exploitation in the porn industry interviewing um, dozens of pornography performers directors producers um, and that is actually a film a series of films that's going to be coming out next year called Beyond Fantasy um, but so between the two of them, they've also co-written a book together um, called The Triple X Factor on pornography. So kind of even though sex trafficking is the primary focus of the organization, there was always this like undercurrent of research into the porn industry, research into how it impacts um, and connects to sex trafficking with the knowledge that at some point when the time was right, this would be a, an assignment that we would take on fully. And we weren't actually planning for to do this campaign, it, we kind of stumbled into it. And that was through my, my colleague, Lila Micklewaite, um, just beginning to have this tremendous grace to go on Twitter. And I'm not a fan of Twitter. It's, it brings out the absolute worst in people. It's horrible. But she had this tremendous grace to start tweeting um, really like powerful anointed truth bombs related to things. And when she started tweeting about Pornhub and just beginning to hear about all these different cases where trafficked underage victims were on Pornhub, um, she began to realize that this company that's the, I mean, by far it's the most well-known pornography website. It's the most well-branded in the world. And it's owned by a, a parent company called MindGeek that own between 80 to 90% of all the online pornography sites. So it's really like the Goliath, the head of the empire of the entire online distribution of pornography. And what a lot of people don't realize is that current pornography is a lot more like YouTube of user generated content that people privately upload. Yes, there's still the pornography that's made in the studios and that's what our film largely addresses. But what my colleague Lila just discovered was that Age and consent is not verified in a single one of the 13 million videos that were on Pornhub. And even to become a verified user, all it took was an email address on a piece of paper. So the, there was zero regulations, which made it totally rife with exploitation. And she was hearing different cases in the news, beginning to go on the site herself and finding very disturbing content that looked completely non-consensual, where women were drugged out, where the the men were touching their eyeballs in the videos, showing them that they were unconscious. I mean, all kinds of things that I won't even go into right now that were very clearly non-consensual videos. And she just began to blow the trumpet on it and was asked by a publication to, to write a, an op-ed. This is in February of 2020. And the incredible timing of all of this was the day after that publication was released, the BBC over in England covered at covered a in-depth story of a victim called Rose Kalemba and her story from when she was 14 years old and had been um, brutally assaulted um, by several guys and the, the, that assault was videoed and put on Pornhub and she dis was discovered this through her um, her classmates and emailed Pornhub every day. She told me sometimes up to three times a day as a 14 year old begging them to take this down and they completely ignored her until she 
posed as a lawyer, threatening legal action, and within 48 hours, they took the videos down. So the, the BBC gave an in-depth reporting of her story. They put the story on hold for months, and it just so happened that it came out the day after Lila's piece, and it, it I believe, sparked an international outcry and awareness that then... Within a few days, someone was like, you guys need to start a petition to call for justice and accountability for Pornhub. And so we were like, okay, well, let's start a petition. Maybe there'll be a few thousand people who who hear about it through that way. And hundreds of thousands of people began signing the petition in 192 countries, almost every nation in the world. And um, to date, there's over 2 million signatures on that petition. And it just sparked this entire... Uh, what we called trafficking hub campaign um, just launched a few months ago. Um, and as I said, we weren't even planning to do this at all. Mm. <laughs> it's amazing how things like that just roll. Like you, you, you see something, you start moving and it spirals. You were saying at the beginning about, and I'm so excited about these films coming out. I can't wait for them about uh, pornography. And Um, there was a documentary on Channel 4 over here that was done by a guy who I think owned porn magazines, had a son, and then said, oh, let's actually find out if this is harmful or not. Um, And he did scans of people's brains, and the same part of the brain that lit up for drug and alcohol addiction would light up for pornography addiction. And it's the same and when we're talking about pornography that's what we're talking about it's easy to just think it's not harmful but it's addictive and when you start just like drugs just like alcohol it leads you down a very very dangerous path and it's horrific 14 years old and I bet that's not the youngest either yeah and more because any child technically is two clicks away from Pornhub because like all you have to do is type porn into a a google search is it comes up on the first page Pornhub, and there's no age barrier to entering the site and all you have to do to enter the site there's already dozens of vid- live videos happening so we've just been trying to help people understand your child if they have access to any kind of digital device they're two clicks away from watching not only pornography but potentially real um abuse of potentially minors, like illegal content, as well as harmful content. And Fight the New Drug are an amazing organization that we're good allies with and friends with. And they've, um, their whole goal is to raise awareness on the, on the harms and help people with addiction and shift the conversation and understanding around pornography. Um, they're, they're not going after the, the legislation around it, uh, but we, we really are calling for Pornhub to be shut down, for there to be criminal justice, accountability for their executives to be held criminally accountable, to get justice and restitution for victims. Um, we aren't trying to criminalize porn performers or trying to um, like harm people in any way um, by uh, you know, implementing laws that, um, that like, j- just like with, Uh, our perspective on prostitution we don't believe in criminalizing people in prostitution but criminalizing those enabling it so the buyers the pimps the traffickers the third parties but saying if you're in prostitution the majority are victims they should not be criminalized and that's the the nordic model approach also known as the abolitionist or equality model and similarly with with this we are calling for action and regulation um and it's been incredible even just yeah in the last two weeks well this whole campaign has been um just pushing and pushing and and meetings and conversations trying to get the attention of government officials government agencies who have the power um because illegal content you know for, for child sexual abuse material um the internet watch foundation confirmed 118 cases in two years and that's just literally the tip of the iceberg um, many, many uh, thousands more um, cases of victims that we've heard from directly or other organizations we work from, uh, work with. Um, and the Girls Do Porn is a current lawsuit that just got um, publicly announced uh, recently of 40 women suing Pornhub 
um, and they were victims of trafficking within the porn industry. Um, but but it's likely, and we've been told that it wasn't just 40 women exploited, there were hundreds of women that were trafficked through that channel. Um, I mean, there's so many stories. We've been trying to document it on our social media over the last few months of making people aware there's been weekly protests in Los Angeles outside the MindGeek office there. Um, we've been engaging artists to help make art around this. We created a two minute animated video that had 33 million views um, in July. And that was like a major moment of um, raising another whole wave of awareness. But it's so important that people know what's going on and even opening up the conversation about it because I, I've noticed, especially in the UK, it's not really talked about as much. It's even more taboo. Um, but the reality is that any child in the last few years, any adolescent is two clicks away from, from this. And it's the most addictive content, in many cases, more addictive than drugs. Um, so I'm so excited even to be opening the conversation and seeing people talk about this in the midst of us um, rallying for justice. Mm. And we, I think the UK is getting, we're getting there slowly but surely, getting more open to talking about it. And is it the same, I'm presuming it is, but is it the same in America, like in England, that owning and distributing child pornography full stop is illegal? I mean, mm -hmm. let's be clear, yeah. filming, recording, distributing, any kind of pornography of anybody without their consent, straight yeah. up wrong, abuse, straight up wrong. Um, but that that specifically is illegal in America as well as the UK. So for a 14 year old or anybody, but specifically a 14 year old to come on and say, that's me, please, can you remove that? And for Pornhub to just dismiss it completely. Yeah. Well, with you saying they dismissed it completely in case people listening go, well, what have Pornhub had to say about this? Okay. Mm -hmm. We can just read the Pornhub statement. So we give them. A couple so of seconds to, to be heard. Yep. Uh, and you saying them dismissing it. So they, they, this is in the article from the New York Times. It says, Pornhub is unequivocally committed to combating child sexual abuse material and has instituted a comprehensive industry-leading trust and safety policy to identify and eradicate illegal material from our community, it said. Pornhub added that any assertion that the company allows child uh, videos on the site is irresponsible and flagrantly untrue so is it uh is it flagrantly untrue uh not according to the victims who are seeing videos of themselves on that site and it's very interesting because days after that article came out Pornhub took down 10.5 million videos of all their unverified uh, videos which 75 percent of the entire content on their website um, so my, my comeback to them was if you've done nothing wrong, if there's no abuse material on your site, why would you take down 10.5 million videos? Mm -hmm. Um, and that the article written by Nicholas Kristoff, he's an award-winning journalist. Um, we started speaking to him several months ago as did other survivors and he's really well respected over here in the U S and has, um, he just did a real deep dive into this and followed different leads, spoke to different survivors, um, spent many months putting together that article that has was really a, um, I don't even know, an, an atomic bomb of, uh, of truth mm. and, um, yeah, caused MasterCard, Visa and Discover within days to completely pull the plug on, on Pornhub. I mean, that's cutting off their finances at the source. There's only cryptocurrency available at present um, for Pornhub. And the way they make their money is through having monthly subscribers who pay um, to not have ads on the videos or to watch more premium mm. subs uh, material. And then they make their, their money through ads on these videos. So a lot of even the victims were saying, not only is a video of my worst abuse on this website, they are making money from ads on those videos of my worst abuse. And for trafficking survivors or rape survivors who are trying to heal from the worst thing or the worst season of their entire life, the knowledge that videos of that abuse are on Pornhub up until last week were able to be downloaded by the thousands, by anyone. So that was the thing. Even if Pornhub took the video down, if 10,000 people had downloaded it, 
any one of those people could re-upload that video at any time yeah. very easily. And so under pressure, you know, we called for them to remove the download button in a very public way, as did the journalist Nicholas Christoph, and they did. Um, but yeah, I mean, it definitely wasn't enough. And I we're we're providing um, the top level trauma informed therapy to victims who've been on Pornhub, um, which is an amazing way that we're able to help and serve and assist them and and connect them with other resources mm-hmm. and services as well. But I I just feel haunted in a um in a very like personal way from just hearing how that affects survivors and really hinders their process to heal Mm. when they know people are watching and um engaging with content of their rape i mean it it, is it defies human imagination that that is even happening and possible Mm. i mean i can't even imagine having my worst moment of my life recorded not only that but out there for it to pop up at any time you lost and complete have, control of it. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, I just, I I can't yeah, even we, imagine. And my heart goes out to them completely. We've had women tell us they, they left the country because personal information about them was even put on the video, like their name and address. Wow. And so they left the country. Yeah. And revenge porn is a whole other category that we've heard from a lot of victims of um, their their exes having secretly filmed um, or even even filmed with consent at the time but it they never gave consent for that to be put on Pornhub in an act of revenge and it it's, serves as this form of terrorism against women because it hinders them getting a job future relationships um it's just so cruel so that's a whole other Doxing. area yeah 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 that's crazy and uh, people listening to this they might say well this is a, this is a this is a porn industry problem. It, it doesn't really affect us in these other platforms and the things that we're using. Um, reading this article, he said a few things which were just mind blowing. Um, but we'll start with this. Uh, depictions of child abuse also appear on mainstream sites like Twitter, Reddit and Facebook. And Google supports the business models of companies that thrive on child molestation. Google returns 920 million videos on a search for young porn. So this isn't something which is just in, in, it's kind of contained in a certain area. This is something which invades all areas yeah. of the internet. Yeah. Yeah. And Google has a responsibility because if they are technically promoting material that they can't guarantee is consensual or not underage, um, then they are in a way in, in cohorts with, with Pornhub. But we, we've had people since we started this campaign ask us, um, well, why are you just going after Pornhub? Why aren't you focusing on the other sites? And what about, yeah, Twitter or Facebook or other web, other sites or platforms that have abusive material as well? And I think we just feel that because Pornhub is the most well-known and again, owned, it is the biggest empire because of it being owned by MindGeek. We wanna, um, if, if we can bring justice to one website that impacts justice across the board and already right. new laws and legislation are being called for, bills are being introduced. It's like you have to have a, a battle strategy of fighting exploitation. And if you can fight exploitation um, and bring about justice and reform through one website, then, um, and I mean, yeah, Google wouldn't have taken the initiative without I mean, the avalanche, I believe, will eventually catch up with them um, uh, unless Pornhub gets shut down before that. But even just pornography websites in general, um, there needs to be huge, huge. It's like such an unregulated industry, especially the the tube site model of user generated content being homemade videos being put up. And recently, a whole other um, thing that's been revealed is uh, MindGeek across all their websites only had 80 moderators and Facebook has between 15 and 30,000. So the largest online pornography, I mean, more, more, more views than Netflix, Amazon and Facebook Pornhub has to have 80 moderators and their moderators have, have, have come out and said business insider reported about it last week that their moderators had to watch 12,000 videos a day. Um, or in an eight hour shift, which is pretty much humanly impossible. So the negligence of them, Pornhub claiming we have a vast team of moderators, which is what they've claimed from the start. They um, clearly have let so much slip through the net. Um, 
That's so dangerous. Yeah. I want to, I think it's a good point as well, Andrew said about, um, you know, people thinking that this is a porn site problem and it mm-hmm. can't be a porn site problem because you have the chain that leads to it, the children who are being abused. So the people that are abusing and trafficking, you then have, you know, the sites like Pornhub that are allowing those videos to be put up on sites, but there wouldn't even be that business if there weren't all the people watching. And I think that to me is what really hits home. And this report as well said in 2015, so this is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, compiled the number of images, videos, and other content related to child sexual exploitation, reported um, that in 2015, it received reports of 6.5 million videos. In 2017, 20.6 million. And in 2019, 69.2 million. Mm -hmm. Like this is not a thing that's going down. Right. And and I think I'm, I'm nervous to hear the numbers from just this year alone when we've all been trapped at home. I know so many of us have had um traumas triggered and when that happens our behavior declines anyway the numbers are going to be skyrocketing and so for everybody out there who's tempted to watch pornography who's tempted to go on these sites who's paying for these subscriptions like your voice matters and please speak up and please be part of the voice that Mm. says we do not want this and i know that for us as well as a ministry we've we've had people on pod other podcast episodes talking to us who are involved with child preventing child abuse Mm. and not involved with child abuse but um telling us telling us yeah telling us stories of how um they've been talking to people and there was one girl and they talked to us about who was i think she was someone might listen to this episode and fact check me but i think she's like 12 or 13 years old and she'd been abused by her uncle for a number of years and then because of the lockdowns ended up being in lockdown with her abuser and ended up pregnant um, and so, you know, we've heard a few stories and I'm sure you have probably heard stories of people that have been impacted by. <laughs> He's crying, not laughing <clears throat> for those listening. Uh, by lockdown. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, the impacts. And it's ridiculous. But um, I don't know if you want to say anything about any of that. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, just just as we were beginning to to blow the trumpet on on Pornhub they went into this entire covid themed um campaign called stay home Pornhub and hmm. they gave free subscriptions to everyone beginning in Italy and then shortly after offered free subscriptions to anyone as though they were giving some kind of public service and they boasted about the increase in uh, viewers and increase in finances. So they have made money um, through exploiting people being at home. And just in general, I feel the the porn industry is is a predator. It's one of the greatest human traffickers of our time because it comes to find youth and children and make them addicted. It has a financial interest in them being um, addicted all their life, being a lifelong subscriber, the younger, the better. And Pornhub, even this year on their Twitter page, they've taken it down now, but they had a meme of Baby Yoda and it said, 10 seconds after my parents leave the house. And in Baby Yoda's eyes was the reflection of Pornhub. And so I was like, are you marketing to, you know, to Baby Yodas of like, when your parents leave the house, come on our website. How old is Baby Yoda meant to be? 12, 8, 5, 2? Um, I just thought that really sh- they showed their cards on the table in that moment, showing that they are um, have no qualms with going yeah. after children and youth. Um, yeah. And so this whole year, you know, seeing those numbers go up, seeing how they're exploiting people's vulnerability during COVID, but at the same time, knowing and praying that justice will eventually come and waiting for that. And we've just begun since the New York Times article, that was like a major catalyst of the next wave of justice yeah. and I mean, we're, we're in the middle of history being made. There's never been so much, um, so many legislation and regulations called for the porn industry and thing, bills that we've hoped for years we would see introduced to protect children um, or help victims get justice, we're seeing. And so we're like right now in this moment, two weeks um, since that article came out, I feel like I'm watching history being made and prayers I've prayed for over a decade are being answered. Yeah. There's um, 
this is probably one of the biggest parts of the article that I read and was like, what the heck? That is crazy. And it says, uh, one study this year by a digital marketing company concluded that Pornhub was the technology company with the third greatest impact on society in the 21st century after Facebook and Google, but ahead of Microsoft, Apple and Amazon. That is crazy statement. And I guess a lot of it obviously is uh, like you alluded to is the impact on society at large. And you have things like um, Netflix with the, what was the show? The oh, Cuties. Cuties. Yeah. So, um, you know, you start to see this knock on effect where other places start to think this is acceptable to allow certain things into society. Um, but I read that statement and was like, wow, that is crazy. Mm-hmm. That yeah. They say that it has a greater impact even than Microsoft, Apple and Amazon. And just think of human beings and young impressionable human beings being indoctrinated with the most like violent, violent material, violence against women, like either real rape or rape being acted as some kind of role play. Um, Mm -hmm. Like the material that people are consuming at a really alarming rate. I mean, it's literally since 2007, the introduction of the, the smartphone in a mainstream way where Um, the entire face of of pornography has really changed since then. So we are right in the middle of a mass social experiment um, of having easy access to pornography like never before and the type of pornography dramatically changed and what would be considered, what was considered hardcore a couple of decades ago would now be considered soft porn. And the introduction of extreme violent um, and our, our documentary that we're bringing out next year focuses on the extreme violence of like, what are the boundaries, the human rights boundaries that the porn industry is uh, is pushing? And then also a, a huge genre in pornography that most people might not know is barely legal, which is girls who days after they turn 18 are um, shooting scenes where they're depicted as five, six, seven year old girls with teddy bears, lollipops, pigtails. And that's technically legal. Um, it was a uh, voted even by the Supreme Court to make that legal as long as the the actors in the films were uh, or the the scenes were over 18 but it is promoting a fantasy of having sex with children and so our our, one of the episodes in our documentary talks about that and is um, trying to bring awareness to this going on like we if, if no one is actually putting the brakes on this and calling for accountability then where is this all going? And I mean, we mm-hmm. we know that we and the tears grow together, the darkness gets darker as um, the light gets lighter as well. But we have to be aware of where the darkness is going, the, de- the direction of potential depravity and exploitation and be really engaged with turning the tide. And, um, and I'm like, Lord, whatever authority you will give us to, to bring about and enact as much justice that is in your heart, um, on earth as it is in heaven mm-hmm. give us that we like we want to see your kingdom come and in this area it looks like um, putting an end to abuse and exploitation on, on a global scale mm. absolutely I um you might be interested to know we did a podcast with an ex-dominatrix um fairly recently on BDSM and the rise in that and how even Today, we're seeing a rise in teenagers' um, first experiences with sex being, including choking and things like that. And for me, this is all, it's all about, let's bring it back to healthy sex. Like sex is great. (laughs) You know, it was made to be fun. It was made to be healthy and enjoyed. And we've just gotten so off the beaten track. And we want to be raising people that are healthy, that can have healthy sex lives, mentally, physic, you know, physically, spiritually. Like, let's bring it back to how it was meant to be created and enjoyed, and not this warped way that's damaging our next generation and those coming up. Like you said, it's affecting how men treat women, how women see themselves, um, yeah. and just how we treat each other. Like we're humans. We're not sex objects. We're humans. And the screen has a way of just separating us from our humanity. And yeah. I can't wait for COVID to be over so that we can all get back to interacting normally and healthily and reminding each other what healthy touch is, just those hugs and 
or high fives even, I don't know, but um, I love what you're doing. I think this campaign is fantastic and we'll make sure as well to share the link for the petition. So everybody, please, please, please go sign it, please. Um, and if anyone wants to read the New York Times article that's been referenced a lot, I think it is a really important one to read. And if you're nervous about searching for it online, I'd say just type in New York Times, the children of Pornhub, and it'll come up. I can actually, I'll put a link to that in the description as well. So they can just click, click here and uh, go straight to it. Yeah. And remember as well, you know, with you guys, with Exodus Cry, with us at Generation to Generation, Operation Open Eyes, this subject can seem so vast and it, it's gut-wrenching. You can't talk about this without being affected. And I think that's why you and us have joined the fight in this. And But there are there is light. There are rays of hope. This is a problem, I believe, that is not hopeless. Yeah. And so please feel the hope and the light in this conversation as well. Yeah, I mean, with, with you talking about that, the article comes out, blows everything up. Can you just share with us some of the stuff which has happened since the article mm. came out? You've talked uh, a couple of times about the uh, MasterCard visa and all that bailing on them, pulling all their business. Uh, can you talk about some of the other stuff which has happened since some of the, uh, I know you've been crazy busy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, talk to us some of the positive stuff which is coming well, so, out. So days after the article, MasterCard visa and, and um, Discover talked about uh, they, they would do an investigation and review. And I think with the threat of that, Pornhub then quickly tried to um, do a bit of a PR stunt and make themselves look better. But they took down the download button. Um, they, they made a few, a few small reforms, regulations, but I think it was just to try and uh, cover their backs and it didn't really make a huge amount of difference except the download button I was really glad they took that down immediately mm -hmm. um, but then a few days after that when the credit card companies said our investigation has led us to confirm that there is criminal content on this site that um, that breaks our, our agreement with Pornhub uh, Pornhub were furious because it just leaves cryptocurrency which many people don't even have or use um, mm -hmm. So then after that, that was when they took down 10.5 million videos, all their non-verified content. So the vast majority of Pornhub is completely um, taken down now. Um, and obviously we're campaigning for the fullness of justice for uh, many, many victims to be able to sue Pornhub and get restitution. We're, um, we're seeing then in Canada what happened was because the New York Times article called out Canada and said, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, you pride yourself being a, a feminist and um, ally with women's rights, but here in your own country on your soil is the biggest online predator against women and children. So he was immediately put on the spot, interviewed by press. And then we saw politicians in Canada call for in investigations. We saw the mayor of Montreal say, it's an absolute disgrace that this company MindGeek is in Montreal. We want them out. We saw um, the, the CEO and COO of MindGeek be unanimously voted upon to appear before a, com a federal committee in Canada and um, address the allegations. So there is some real, a huge spotlight on them like never before, really negative press, and even just the, the brand damage of Pornhub through what has been exposed. Um, we've had so many people this entire year reach out to us and say like, well, now I know that the, the videos on Pornhub might be non-consensual. Like this whole time I thought everyone was, you know, fully consenting and paid to do this and wants to do this. And they, they bought in the narrative that Pornhub had up until this year successfully permeated to my mainstream consciousness that it was all um, above board. And people are telling us they can no longer watch, go on Pornhub knowing the abuse that they could be watching or that's taking place behind the screen or saying, I, I've wanted to quit porn for years. And this has been like the final push to help me do it. And thank you for your work and your page. I had a, um, a young, a teenage boy from the UK tell me that he had, was shown porn age 10 and was addicted throughout his teen years. And it, the amount of um, just havoc and, and shame um, and depression that it brought him 
it's been something he's really been battling his whole teenage years and he was like to see you guys take on this battle and to shut down Pornhub like I'm with you 100% thank you so much for doing this um and so I just from every angle you know our motivation ultimately is for justice for the the victims um but I just you know the the zeal of the Lord is in the heart of all of us to to see um an ending to that to the evil that is being um, mm. like spread in such a mainstream way and um, through this website. So it's been a wild few weeks and then more is coming. Like there's things I can't even announce on the podcast publicly of other bombshells that are going to be happening in the next, in the coming weeks. Um, but there's a lot more to come. For people listening, um, you know, they hear about this campaign. Let's say it all comes crumbling down Pornhub's gone, ceases to exist, or or it's there but in a heavily regulated form. Uh, what's next? Yeah, well, there's many other websites still left <laughs> that we want to see the same reforms and regulations be um, implemented with them, and even just the notion of us calling for agent consent being verified on every video, not by the the websites themselves we're saying you can't be trusted to self-regulate you clearly haven't you need to have a third party regulating you um, to prevent exploitation government id has to be issued and proven to show the people in the videos are over 18 and then even just breaking down the notion of consent like is consent just signing a piece of paper what if that signature was coerced or manipulated what if there's a third party of a pimple trafficker behind uh, manipulating that signature what if someone is under the influence of drugs or has severe mental illness like there are so many ways that consent can be exploited or manipulated and that's what we see in sex trafficking every day um so i really want to see a a clamp down on exploitation and abuse to ensure that that um, no one is is being coerced into consenting and even just like survivors I've worked with who entered the porn industry even as an adult even over 18 they 10 years later are trying to rebuild their life with their job their career their family and they desperately want the videos of them on Pornhub taken down but they can't because they signed paperwork with the the studio if they were professionally in the industry and so I just feel like there should be a way to, um, um, to, yeah, to, to enable justice um, for for, the, for those. And some people are very hard hearted and say, well, they consented at the time; it's their own fault. And a lot of people were very, in my opinion, really. Um, can have quite a cruel, hard-hearted, even misogynistic perspective on, on survivors or people in prostitution. And they're like, oh, well, they chose it. You know, what did they expect was going to happen? Like horrible um, things like that. And for the, the example that I just mentioned of, of um, this woman who's been out for years, she, she had severe mental illness when she entered the porn industry age 18. And so I just feel like there are so many ways consent is being manipulated by this industry. And we really want to... Um, just clamp down on abuse and exploitation and on the flip side help raise awareness um, for those who are watching porn who don't um, maybe realize the amount of abuse and exploitation the first time I ever made the connection between porn and trafficking was when I was working in Cambodia and I had the victims I remember this one in particular this girl who'd been trafficked from the countryside to the city age 11 was trapped in a brothel and she told me that Western customers, guys would come in and on their phone would show her pornography videos and um, make her copy it. And I remember just thinking at the time, for anyone who denies the link between porn and trafficking and how it fuels demand, like that's right there. It's the marketing force behind trafficking. And it normalizes the entire idea of commodifying a woman's body and um, purchasing her as a sex, sex object, as a disposable sex slave for a few minutes or a few hours. And like you were saying earlier, Daniela, like bringing back, um, like the, the perspective on sexuality is something that is sacred and valuable. And what, what does, what is a healthy sexuality or what even is the messaging around it that, um, you know, for those who don't subscribe to the Christian faith, but what, what can we talk about sexuality that, culture can get on board with of like 
mutual enthusiastic consent and money not being a part of that interaction because of the exploitation it invites and the power dynamics that relate to, to Me Too of how um, power and consent can be manipulated. So just calling for exploitation to, to end it. I mean, it's a huge conversation and, and sexuality is so powerful. We know that because if it wasn't, rape wouldn't be such a horrifying lifelong thing to, for someone to to get over right um, so trying to engage fully in the problem but engage fully in in the solution and mm. and the hope and redemption and for you know for porn addicts as well like we um oh even I, i've done outreach at pornography conventions in las vegas and talked to porn performers but also producers and directors and um it's it's those are some of the hardest conversations to have where I'm really like, okay, God, I, I don't want to partner with the spirit that even dehumanizes these people that make me angry. What is your destiny for them that I can partner with in my heart and pray for them and agree with? Cause we want redemption to come for all. And that's our heart. Mm. I, oh, that's just got me all excited. <laughs> I love it. And I hope we can partner together more in the future i think our hearts are so similarly lined and yeah i would love to meet you guys in in england sometime where are you based again uh nick well cambridge yeah nick cambridge <laughs> <laughs> so yes. is as we as we come to the end is there anything that that you want to say that we haven't covered that we haven't brought up but you're like you know what i really need to share this or you know there's something that people can do to to help support you all um, well, I will just say like for anyone listening, especially if you're a believer, which I believe is most of your audience, but um, the parable of the Good Samaritan is something that I often think of with related to this work and how it's so easy to stay in our self-preservation bubble and not get involved in anything that's messy and dark and the mindset of the Levite and the priest to just get on with the church programs to just, you know, stay in their safe little lane and not get involved in a potentially dangerous situation of a naked, bloody person on the side of the road. But Jesus invitation to love your neighbor as yourself looks mm. like getting involved and loving him through getting involved and having your yeah. eyes open. And the good Samaritan was first moved with compassion. And so it starts with being willing to hear and, and grieve and let the horror of this topic touch your heart mm -hmm. and I just know that when I signed up to this uh, of saying Jesus if you ever provide an open door for me to do anything with this I will say yes I'll go through it it was because I touched the grief in the father's heart over this issue and when we're friends with the Lord when we're when we have intimacy with God we want to care about the things that he cares about we want to respond mm -hmm. to the things that he is really wanting his people to engage in and I truly believe this is one of the greatest assaults on the image of God in a man and a woman on the planet. And it's so important for the church to be engaged in and, in, and educated by. And even I'm often shocked with how um, many Christians have no idea what the Nordic model is. And they have no idea how to engage in discussion or debate about how to practically um, bring about abolitionist legislation around the sex industry, how to um, talk, how to understand sex trafficking, um, and so if you, I'd say for sure, please watch Nefarious, um, our short animated videos that are like two minutes each, there's four or five of them. And just even begin to educate yourself. The number one book I would recommend is a book called Paid For by Rachel Moran as a survivor memoir that really gives the macro and micro perspective on this. And I just think um, even if this isn't your main like calling or or, or, or passion as a believer, we have a responsibility to engage with an issue that's ultimately affecting everyone. And if it's not, if porn isn't affecting you, it's affecting a friend or family member or, or will affect your children. So I just feel like this is something that everyone needs to be aware of and engage with and prayerfully consider how they can be part of, um, of partnering with the Lord to bring his kingdom on earth in this way. Amen. <sighs> same heart we have so the same heart um so part of how operation open eyes started was um i was got invited to, to work in thailand with a home out there and i'm standing in the middle of the red light district there faced with it all and i 
got the scripture, pray for the workers, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I looked around and went, no joke. <laughs> and then um, I had this kind of picture, if you like, of Jesus standing at the gate with the estimated 27 million or however many caught in human trafficking behind him. And he was holding the gate closed. And then every now and then a survivor would get released. And it was like every time we as a society failed in the restoration of that survivor, it was like the candle got extinguished and they went back even more hopeless. And I felt like Jesus saying, tell the church to get ready. I'm standing back soon. Tell the church to get ready. And that has been the kind of mantle that Operation Open Eyes has carried was, okay, how can we get the church to get ready because I broke my heart there was some statistics that said you know only one to two percent of survivors are being rescued and out of that one to two percent 70 to 75 percent are being re-trafficked and to me that's those numbers are way it's too low for the rescue and way too high for the being re-trafficked and you know the restoration when we talk about rescue when we talk about um justice it begins with the physical rescue it begins with their video getting taken down it begins with all that but their trauma lasts a long time and the effects last a long time in this article it talks about one girl committing suicide um like these after effects are no joke and i strongly believe as followers of christ and in the body of in the body of Christ in the church we have what these survivors need we have the ultimate hope we have the ultimate restoration and um you know this is the song I've been singing for the last 10 years like everybody can join this fight everybody has part of the answer and so please get in touch follow Exodus Cry you know Operation Open Eyes because we need you you let me finish by just reading this this last part of the of the article says the world has often been oblivious to child sexual abuse from the catholic church to the boy scouts too late we prosecute individuals like jeffrey epstein or r kelly but we should also stand up to corporations that systematically exploit children with pornhub we have jeffrey epstein times 1000 so helen thank you so much for being willing to stand up to the corporations uh, you and um and obviously my sister cry. involved with exodus cry and so thank you for willing to be stand up and thank you so much for taking the time to to join us and to talk to us about what you're doing and the whole campaign so again like my sister said everyone go check out the links sign petitions um don't just say that you want to be a part of ending it but actually go and do something to to be a part of supporting what they're doing so thank you so much yeah thank you pleasure talking with you and Look forward to meeting you guys in person as well sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Doing it together. Thank you for listening to this episode. If it inspired you, please rate us and subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify or another podcast platform.